doesn't need any introduction, so I'm going to let him take over. I just have to warn everyone, I've already said this, but my internet is spotty for some reason, so um, I know there are other people on who can take over for some reason I can't get on, but I know Rick can keep us entertained for a while, so we're happy to have you back. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. So, um, I, gave, I, I, I think you may have, I'm not sure you were on, I gave just a little update that we here in Boston have already been doing or not already have resumed doing our in-person um, sessions and how lucky we feel to be doing them. And we hope that we can help other places that don't feel comfortable doing that, um, educate them in any ways they'd like. Huh. Um, and, and when you say we, does that mean you wanna be working on uh, MAP2 or, or not? <laughs> not today, Rick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, Thank you for your persistence. I know it well. <laughs> you know, it, it works a lot of times, um, and the cost of it is low. <laughs> um, I would like to show just a few slides, so I'm not sure if I can um, share screen or need authorization. Or R Rachel did it, and Sherry will I'll, help you with that. Yeah, I will. Okay, because I see host disabled attendee screen sharing. Sherry's taking now. Over. You can. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right, this is just gonna be a few slides. Um, okay, let's delete this here for a second. Okay, so this is the slide that I wanted to share first, um, just for people to um, see about this uh, psychedelic renaissance that we talk about. So this is the um, Web of Science Psychedelic Publications count by year and it goes up to 2020. And what you can see is this kind of exponential rise um, starting in around 1990. Um, and really starting here in 1992 is when the FDA said that they would open the door to psychedelic research again. 1990 is when Rick Strassman got permission for the um, DMT study. And then 1992 is where FDA said they would open things uh, for research and gave Charlie Grove and I permission for uh, the phase one dose response safety study with MDMA. And then things have just been growing ever since. And I think that they're going to, you know, continue to grow as this field expands. Um, the other slide I just wanted to show was uh, something following up on Rachel's thing. And this is just to um, show how I would say in bad faith, uh, the fears of neurotoxicity were uh, promulgated. So this was the slide that uh, Rachel showed. She said I'd have a lot more to speak about it, <laughs> which I, I'll just briefly say that this was um, shown to the uh, Senate Subcommittee on Government Affairs. The result of this now is that if you're caught with a certain amount of MDMA compared with the same amount of cocaine, your sentence is going to be greater for MDMA than for cocaine. So this is completely out of whack with the actual uh, dangers of the drugs. And the way in which Lashner um, succeeded in his mind, because he kept uh, pandering to Congress and getting the budget of NIDA increased, and he helped see it get over a billion dollars every year, um, was through this slide. And so this was this uh, baseline of a healthy uh, person. And then this is a supposed reduction of cerebral blood flow two weeks after MDMA. So the first thing to say from this is that in this paper, this was based on um, the interest that I had and that Charlie Grobe had in terms of understanding what's actually going on uh, with MDMA. So we were aligned with neurotoxicity researchers funded by NIDA. And through our phase one dose response uh, safety study, um, we volunteered uh, to, to have some of our subjects, um, we had about 28 subjects, 10 of them went through this um, study here. Um, and this was um, a very misleading presentation of the review of the, the results of the study, because what the study showed was that there was a temporary drop in uh, regional cerebral blood flow that had nothing to do with functional consequences, but that at the next follow-up, it had returned to normal. That was at two months. So that there's no lasting effect whatsoever. And so you end up seeing this baseline healthy brain that they um, 
you know, that Leshner was showing to Congress. And then this makes it look like there's some kind of long-term permanent damage when actually it was a short-term thing not connected to damage at all. However, that's not the worst part about this slide. Um, the worst part of this slide was that this was terrible staff work on the part of Alan Leshner and the other people, not so much him, I guess, but his staff. So what they didn't know is that when we first negotiated with FDA, which they could have known by reading our paper about the study, but what they um, didn't seem to know is that in our early negotiations with FDA, they were concerned about the effect of MDMA on um, causing some kind of potential repetitive, addictive patterns of use. And so the FDA said that they would only let us do the study, this phase one uh, safety, dose response safety study, only in people that had previously used MDMA and had not developed a substance use disorder. So this healthy baseline brain that you see right there actually was from a study where the average lifetime consumption was 13 grams before they got in the study, a median 211 exposures. So these were heavy ecstasy users who had not developed a substance use disorder. And so what Leshner was showing was that MDMA didn't cause long-term changes. He just didn't know that. So that this baseline brain is of a heavy ecstasy user that he was presenting to the senators as if it was evidence of um, somehow a healthy, normal brain. Then they took MDMA and now they've got lower cerebral blood flow. So that's the um, way in which research was fundamentally dishonestly twisted to try to scare um, members of the Senate in order to increase the penalties on prohibition. And this was several uh, years uh, before we actually were able to start the first MDMA PTSD study inside the United States. And this was part of the effort actually to help stop us from doing that. So that, that's just that background. Um, what I also wanna share is something else, a uh, question was asked about um, to Rachel about uh, SSRIs and MDMA. And so I, I just wanna share that I think one of the areas that um, we would like to be researching in the future is uh, the combination of SSRIs and MDMA. We, we do require people to taper off all of their SSRIs. It's five half-lives and at least one week, preferably two weeks. So it differs for which SSRI, but again, five half-lives and one or two weeks. We do seem to see that the longer time people have tapered off of SSRIs, the better they do. So the issue though, is that there are a bunch of people that uh, are on SSRIs that might not wanna go through the tapering process, but still have substantial amounts of PTSD symptoms and could qualify for the study, which requires either um, our first phase three study was severe. Uh, the second one will be moderate to severe PTSD. So what, what I think is gonna be very important to do is study the safety of administering MDMA to people while they're still taking SSRIs. Um, there's been uh, informal experiments uh, done multiple times by various uh, underground therapists who have administered roughly double the dose of MDMA to people on SSRIs, and they seem to have a pretty full uh, MDMA experience without evidence of serotonin syndrome and with some lasting benefits. So there may be a whole other um, area that we really need to look at. Um, there is obviously this concern about serotonin syndrome, which we need to take seriously. People do take MDMA at raves, dance all night, overheat and die. Um, they don't have adequate fluid hydration. Um, they're in very um, ambient temperature high environments. They're physically exercising. We, we've never seen a case of this in research, but in any case, I think that one of the areas of future research is going to be um, the combination of, of MDMA with people who are on SSRIs. Um, the, the other big area, and this is something that Rachel is preparing to do, um, will be group therapy. I mean, she's first is gonna be preparing to do uh, individual therapy, looking at two sessions versus three sessions. Um, the logic there is that we find that at the two month follow-up, which is the uh, primary outcome measure, when you compare the therapy with uh, inactive placebo versus therapy with MDMA, that's the, the comparison. 
for uh, approval. And then the 12-month follow-up is more for insurance companies to see, is this durable? How do we justify the expense of it, which we've talked about before? Um, but the, the thing that we notice is that people keep getting better. Um, so that on average, the results at 12 months are better than the results at two months. And we haven't offered any additional therapy. Now, people can go back to variety of different things. So we can't attribute this just to MDMA, but somehow or other, there is this uh, process that has started that people seem to keep getting better as they go forward. And so what Rachel is going to be looking at is uh, two sessions versus three sessions. Uh, the two sessions have nine 90 minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions. The uh, three sessions have 12. And the question is maybe at the 12 month follow-up, the two groups are very similar. Um, it could be that that's the case. It could be that when you have three sessions, you um, recover more quickly. Uh, you, you get over PTSD symptoms more quickly, but maybe with two sessions uh, near the end of this, uh, or at the end of this 12 month follow up, you're more or less at the same place. We don't know if that's true. Also, there's a lot to be said for ending suffering as sooner than the better, but this is a way to look at the economics of it. Maybe two sessions could become the standard model, and for some people, they will need more. Um, but anyway, that, that's what Rachel's going to be doing with her team. And then in preparation for getting experience with individuals and then to do group therapy. So in the line with what uh, we're talking about with the, the work with Rachel at the Bronx VA, you know, we've been trying for 30 years to start research inside the VA. So another important thing to report is that on Tuesday, uh, Rachel and I are going to be meeting with the uh, deputy director of the VA's program called Prevents, run out of the White House, and they're very interested in learning more about MDMA. So we're just moving increasingly to um, higher levels of uh, political uh, involvement with helping veterans, and that they're very interested in our results. And so we'll see what happens. Uh, growth of this uh, meeting on Tuesday, but I think Rachel and I will be really um, able to present what we know, and then we'll, we'll see what, what can come from that in terms of further integration with the VA's priorities, which are, of course, to uh, reduce veteran suicides. Um, another thing connected to, with Rachel's protocol that is important to share is that, and I've talked in this before, is that we've had some uh, challenges with the FDA in terms of what they say are the requirements for the therapist, the credentials for the therapists. So um, when we negotiated in 2017 with the FDA in the context of a formal dispute, uh, a um, um, special protocol assessment process, we negotiated that we do want the two-person team. We um, prefer it to be male, female, although it doesn't always have to be that way. And two uh, women, two men we've had, and, and they can get really good results. Um, you could really get excellent results with one therapist too, but it seems that it's, it's better with two for a bunch of different reasons. We'd like to keep the two therapy team. And also um, what we were able to negotiate with FDA is that the lead person was a master's level therapist and the second person didn't have to have a license, could be a student in a program to get a license or a, could be somebody that didn't even have a license, that had some mental health training, could be a nurse, um, you know, others, social worker that, that wasn't a clinical social worker. So that was what we negotiated. Then along comes the, the two psilocybin companies, USONA and Compass, and they negotiated with FDA, and FDA started thinking this is really um, growing. We might be the first ones to approve a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, and we'll be under scrutiny. So they started being um, more concerned about um, their own uh, regulatory reputations in a sense. And so they started saying in a misguided way that the lead person need to be an MD or a PhD, not just a master's level therapist, which we feel was makes no logical sense whatsoever and increases the costs. And so we've been in the process of this formal dispute resolution um, with FDA. The other thing that we had arranged with FDA during the special protocol assessment is that there didn't need to be a doctor on site, that the doctor would do the prescribing, the doctor would do the screening, but that the doctor needed to be on call, not on site. And so in addition to this 
idea that the uh, MD PhD needed to be um, the lead person, they also wanted a doctor on site. Again, um, increasing costs with uh, no real rationale for why that's necessary. Certainly, it's consistent with what we've um, the data that we've gathered. So for Rachel's study, the reason that we um, have to go one more round with the FDA is that we decided that even though Rachel has an MD or PhD on every therapy team, and even though there's doctors throughout the uh, building there and um, in the facility uh, on site, we decided that since she's talking about PTSD patients, which are the same group of patients that the FDA has approved for phase three, with a master's level therapist as the lead person and a doctor on a call, not on site, that we would um, make it more difficult for the FDA. Rather than conceding something, we would force them to um, wrestle with this issue. How could they justify putting higher standards on this study inside the VA than they were putting on us? And we had just um, gathered the data of the different teams that we had that some had MD-PhD on them, some didn't. We looked at safety and efficacy, there was no difference. And then we looked at the um, sites that had a physician on site or not, and then no significant difference between um, safety outcomes. So there was really no reason for them to justify this, but we thought, okay, we'll, we'll make it hard on them. And it's gonna take a while to train Rachel's team and do various things. So we could afford a month or two delay so we pressed the FDA and uh, forced them to uh, consider this issue of how they could um, sort of justify imposing different standards on um, the same population. So what it turned out that the FDA did was that they made a compromise in their minds. And what they said is that there needs to be a physician in the building. And as long as there's a physician in the building, there doesn't need to be an MD PhD as the lead person. So we're sort of halfway inching towards the resolution that we need, but we don't want to accept the fact that there should be an MD in the building. Um, you know, for the future clinics that will be set up, there will always need to be uh, physicians prescribing, there will always need to be medical screening but there does not need to be a physician on site and that would limit the kind of psychedelic clinics that could um, flourish after approval, increase their costs for no justifiable uh, benefit. And so we're already seeing this um, yielding to some extent on the part of the FDA so that now as long as there's a physician in the building, there doesn't need to be necessarily um, masters, I mean an MD or PhD is the lead therapist. So we are gonna continue through this formal dispute resolution that'll take us the next uh, two, three months, we think, to try to uh, further resolve that and knock out the idea that there needs to be a physician um, in the building. So that, that's where we're at with that. With our uh, MAP1, our phase one, uh, our first phase three study, um, we had our interim analysis, which was uh, very successful in, in March. And then COVID shut things down. We had the, the study was originally designed to be 100 people. And the interim analysis was on 60% or 60 had reached their primary outcome measure at this two month. And when all 100 had been enrolled, although a lot of those had not yet actually started treatment, they were in the tapering process or in the early discussion. So then COVID um, shut things down. And then the FDA reached out to all of their sponsors, not just us, and they said, do you want the possibility of ending the study early? Because uh, you know, the time windows have changed, people are under new stresses, things like that. So we negotiated with FDA and they agreed that we would be able to end the study with 90 people instead of 100. And all 90 wouldn't necessarily have gone through the full treatment of all three MDMA sessions and the 12 90 minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions. All they had to do was have a baseline measure, one experimental session, and then they had to do um, one outcome measure after at least one session. Some of them, many of them had two, some had one. Um, for COVID, we were able to go to um, virtual sessions for um, having um, operation sessions, but MDMA sessions themselves, we don't think should ever be virtual. And yeah, maybe we can get the FDA. I'm just seeing Lisa's comment. Maybe we can get the FDA to accept virtual MD instead of in the building. There's no way that they can justify what they're trying to do. 
So that's that's a good thought as well. So in any case, though, um, we came to agreement with FDA that we would end with 90, and the last person is going to be treated um, in a couple weeks before the end of July. And then um, August and September is going to be for um, cleaning up the data, uh, monitoring all the study sites data, doing what's called data lock, and then doing the final analysis. So we will know after before the end of September whether the first of two phase three studies was uh, statistically significant and was successful. Now, when the interim analysis was done, it was assuming that it took the results from the 60 subjects and extrapolated to uh, adding the other 40 at all of 100. So ending at 90 instead of 100 is a risk on our part. It means that we don't have um, as many subjects and therefore the um, uh, chances of getting statistical significance are reduced somewhat. But we were previously 90 percent or greater likelihood of getting statistical significance. And we think that we're close to that um, still right now. We thought it was worth the, uh, the risk. And so we're, we're very optimistic about how that'll turn out. But we, we won't know till uh, near to the end of uh, September. Um, as um, Anne said, we are starting to do some um, screening and working with people for MAP2. But because of COVID, we're just not sure. Not all sites are ready to start up. We had predicted that it would be done by the summer of uh, 2021, but we no longer think that's the case. We think it'll be probably into 2022 that it will take to get the next uh, 100 people enrolled and treated in the study. Also, in the MAP1, all the people that had the placebo have the opportunity to go through the study again with open label MDMA as part of the deal that we made for people. If you get the placebo, you will get MDMA. We just have to wait till all the study's over. So we're hopeful that by the end of um, 2021, early 2022, we'll have the data from both our phase three studies. And we're spending millions of dollars now on, on various other animal toxicity studies and um, other studies that the FDA wanted us to do as part of our package to the uh, new drug. Uh, application. Um, we're also going to be starting expanded access sometime, uh, we hope, in um, September or October or so. We've got 50 subjects approved for expanded access, and um, one of the first sites will be um, a site, Manish Agarwal in Maryland at the Aquilina Cancer Center, but he'll also be uh, a phase, uh, an expanded access site, um, and we'll have uh, the opportunity potentially of more uh, military people from Walter Reed or from um, just the military in general that may be uh, willing to go to this uh, Maryland site. So that's so we are starting to uh, open up expanded access. We, we have received various donations for supporting um, um, patients of color to go through expanded access. So expanded access patients pay for it themselves and um, the sponsor doesn't have to pay for it. So. Um, We've got uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars now to support um, patients of color to uh, go through expanded access. And we also um, are happy to announce that I did a podcast with Gwyneth Paltrow from Goop. And uh, Gwyneth is donating $20,000 to support a woman of color uh, patient to go through expanded access. And so we're, we're going to have a special landing page. I think it's the 21st of July. The podcast with Gwyneth and myself is going to be released. And then Goop people can donate either to our big fundraising campaign, which I'll mention in a moment, or to supporting um, women of color to go through, or, or men of color, however they want to do it, uh, patients and therapists of color to go through the training program. So that's what's happening. And also we've gotten um, our protocol into the FDA about our new study that uh, Sanjay Singhal is funding from Toronto with MDMA for eating disorders. So that's going to be in Vancouver, Toronto, and also um, in Denver. So we're very excited about that as well. In Israel, um, the Ministry of Health has also approved um, 50 people for expanded access. Uh, it's the first country in the world where the Ministry of Health is actually do donating um, services. Um, you know, we, we heard from Rachel that the VA is paying for people's salaries and stuff while they go through our training. So that's starting to be the first money from uh, the VA we're doing. So that's that's really terrific. Uh, and in Israel, we raised about uh, half a million. Israeli government is putting up uh, the other half a million for um, people's time and facility services. And so there's going to be training 
program starting in Israel to train more therapists for expanded access. And we're also trying to get a protocol that we're calling a MT4, meaning MDMA therapists, it's the fourth one, where therapists can receive MDMA as a patient, the way that um, Rachel talked about it in MT1. MT2 is a, a, a shorter version of that without the placebo session and the day after, just the MDMA and the day after. So we're still negotiating with FDA about that. That's part of this formal dispute resolution. And then MT4 is going to be worked, uh, has now um, been submitted to the Ministry of Health in Israel. And then MT3 is going to be uh, in the Netherlands with Eric Vermetten. So that we'll hopefully have another opportunity to give MDMA to therapists um, in Europe. And so where we're at with um, Israel is, again, resuming um, uh, MAP2, uh, also doing the crossover, and then um, doing this expanded access. And we're about to start, uh, we have meetings with lawyers and stuff about a MAPS Israel that we're starting. Um, in Europe, um, things are looking better uh, by, according to the virus, uh, than they are here in the US. And so the sites are starting. And so um, the Czech Republic is gonna be first, um, then the Netherlands, then in England. Um, we're still working to get approval in Germany, Norway, um, also um, Finland and uh, Portugal. So um, we don't have the money that we need for Europe, but we have a, a, a bit more than $2 million to do the training, the open label training of the therapists to get them ready to do a phase three study in Europe. We've already negotiated with the European Medicines Agency. We only have to do 70 subjects instead of 100 in Europe. We think we can get statistical significance with 70, which is why we're comfortable going to 90 um, for MAP1 here. And so we hope by next summer, we'll be ready to move into phase three in Europe. And of course, that means um, raising a bunch more money. Um, also, to say this, I've been um, talking with the head of the Therapeutic Goods Authority, which is called the TGA in Australia. And it looks like they're the first in the world that's willing to uh, approve MDMA on a, quote, provisional basis, sort of like expanded access. But we're still trying to understand exactly what that means. I don't know that it's on a name patient basis, but in any case, um, we've met with the head of the TGA, and what we're going to do is, after we get the data from the first phase three study, we're going to submit that to the TGA along with all of our phase two data and see if we can get this provisional approval. So that's going really well. Um, also, just in other areas, which we call our pipeline, uh, we're now about 100 people working for MAPS. It's been growing at an incredible rate. Um, again, all funded by donations, although we have been offered uh, all the money we need from investors, which we've told no, because we really want to demonstrate a new way to um, contribute to mass mental health and not have the pressures of uh, pricing and various things to return money to um, investors. So we're, we're hoping that we can go further. But in addition, so our main pipelines is going to be other uses of MDMA. Initially, I think group therapy, uh, eating disorders, social anxiety, which is now going to be probably an enormous problem because of the virus, we've done one small study on social anxiety or MDMA for people that were um, anxious about life-threatening illnesses. And Ben Sess in England has done MDMA for alcoholism. And he's got really good three-month data and he'll be looking at 12-month and 18-month follow-up data as well. The theory is you help people resolve their traumas. They don't need to um, escape in drugs. Um, but what we're also doing is working on a protocol for marijuana for veterans with PTSD to submit to the state of Michigan. Um, they approved uh, marijuana legalization and in that bill, which they approved by initiative, there's $40 million for research to veterans mental health and a veteran to reduce veteran suicides. And it can only go to nonprofits or academic researchers. And so the first year is 20 million. Um, the second year is or 500 subjects throughout the country. So we're moving forward on that. And then Ibogaine uh, has been another priority. And so I just wanted to share that um, I had a meeting the other day with a tie with Christian Angermeyer, Srini Ross, and also um, Florian, the, the chief science officer 
the co-founder and then the, the CEO, because they've bought patents for Ibogaine and nor Ibogaine from Deborah Mash, and they are now wanting to develop these in a for-profit way. So they have all sorts of access to resources, which is the main advantage of going for-profit. It's, it's much easier to get money from investors, particularly now where investors are just throwing money without even knowing what they're doing in this area. Um, but we don't want to uh, do that. And so um, what I discussed with um, the Atai people is that we want to go forward with FDA with a pre-IND meeting, meaning we want to um, summarize the world's literature, uh, design a protocol for a phase one slash two safety study, meaning it would be um, a safe study dose response, but it wouldn't be healthy volunteers. It would be people who had problems with opiates. And then we would look at the safety. People have died from Ibogaine in terms of heart problems. But if it's a medicalized situation, we believe, and others do as well, that nobody should die and it can be properly conducted. So what we want to do is sort of open that up. And what it turns out a tie is going to do is they're focusing on um, Health Canada and they're going to work there. So what we uh, agreed is that our, our work can be synergistic. We're not sure how far we'll go with this, but the very next step will be a probe of what FDA thinks. And we will share our information with a tie, but also with everybody else. We're going to make it public. And so we're going to have our investigators brochure, which is the summary of the world literature. They also have studies that they bought that have never been released uh, that Demerex or uh, Deborah Mash did. So they may or may not choose to add information to our package. Then we'd have to all agree to sign these NDAs because they're a for-profit approach. Um, but then it would be a better probe of what FDA actually thinks. So the, the, this was a tremendously successful situation for me because I was worried that um, this would, our efforts to do this would be seen as uh, potential competition or that they would worry that it, or I was worried that they would claim that their patents blocked what we were doing. But as it turns out, the core patent on Ibogaine for opiate addiction is in the public domain and they've agreed that. And so anyway, so that's what we're going. And then the last thing I'll say, and then we can have uh, time for questions is that we are now engaged in this uh, capstone campaign. So what that is, is um, we have um, done an awful lot of work, uh, you know, to get to the phase three studies. Um, and we did that, you could say, with a small group of people who were highly motivated, had pharma experience, but were um, true believers and willing to work for way less than pharma and, uh, and so we got our whole teams kind of moved forward and that, but burnt out and we had a lot of volunteers and it, it, we weren't sure that we would succeed. So now that it looks like we're, we're, we've got a very good chance of succeeding and the people were burnt out and complaining and um, there's all sorts of expertise that we didn't have um, in our small groups that wasn't necessary at the time. So we've done sort of rebaselining of all of that and all these new experts we're bringing in. And we figure that we need $30 million to complete the work. We've raised about $90 million so far in the history of MAPS, um, or another 30 million. And all of that has gone for everything MAPS has done over the last 34 years. So it's not that we've put 90 million directly into MDMA research. A lot of that was trying to start the research, but we think with 30 million more, We'll be able to get approval. We'll be able to complete all the studies. If the data is looking good, we'll be able to get approval in the US, Israel, and Canada. And there's uh, roughly 10 million in there for commercialization expenses, meaning expanding our therapy training program. And um, to some extent, subsidizing uh, expanded access. And so we, we came up with a strategy of how to raise the $30 million, which was the first 10 would come from our board of directors and close allies. The middle 10, we were applying to the Stephen and Alexander Cohn Foundation for a $10 million matching grant. They're the ones that funded the eight and a half million dollars of the 17 million money that went to Johns Hopkins for their psychedelic research center. And they've also funded four and a half million to USONA the Stephen and Alexander Cohn Foundation. And so we were working with them about a $10 million middle and um, they were very sympathetic. We, we made a lot of progress, but then COVID hit and they told us that they were postponing all um, psychedelic giving while they focused on COVID and they were postponing psychedelic giving to at least the end of this year or early next year. So that was heartbreaking and disappointing for us. But um, And then uh, about a month ago, a uh, month and a half ago, I did, um, was going to do an interview with Tim Ferriss for his podcast. 
and um, my microphone didn't work. And Tim was like, well, you know, let's, you know, postpone this a week so that the microphone is better. And, um, you know, we really want it to be as good as possible. And then we said, well, as long as we're waiting a week, let's see if we can um, get some sort of a matching grant. So with that, when his podcast was released, he could announce a matching grant. And Joe Green from uh, the Psychedelic Science Funders Collaborative said he'd offer a $100,000 matching grant. Well, I did not realize how incredibly well connected and motivated um, Tim Ferriss was. He was also with his girlfriend, Bea, who's interested in becoming a, a psychedelic therapist in the same training in Israel that Rachel talked about for therapists. So Tim uh, really wanted to check us out. And then we spent a day in Bethlehem um, with the prog program that we're doing for Israelis and Palestinians doing MDMA and ayahuasca together for psychedelic rec reconciliation. So. What, what happened then was that um, uh, Tim spoke to a few people and he got $5 million matching grant. He put in a million of his own money and he got four others, including John Griffin, who was the person that's funding Rachel's study, who had previously said to me that he would not fund Capstone because he wanted to do just things he could do and he wanted to support Rachel's project at the Bronx VA and it could need more money as, as it moves forward. But Tim got, uh, got him to do it. Uh, Blake Mykowski from Tom's Shoes, uh, RX Bar, uh, Peter Rahel, and um, James Bailey. So each of them put in $5 million. So then we have a $5 million matching grant, and we did the um, a podcast, which went great. Um, and then Tim got even more inspired. So then he called Alex Cohn, and she had not read our proposal. After she read our proposal, um, she decided that she would offer a $5 million matching grant to match with the five that Tim had already raised. So now we have a $10 million matching grant and it, it's all or nothing 90 days from the release of the podcast. So we have till September 10th to raise uh, $10 million. If we make that, we raise, uh, <clears throat> we get the matching 10 and the original 10 from our board and PSFC that'll give us the $30 million capstone. Um, after that, We'll uh, rest for a week or two, celebrate, and then we're starting to raise another 30 million to globalize, to, to go to Europe and Australia and the rest of the world with our data. Um, so we are now at this point where we've raised about 3.6 million of the, um, <clears throat> of the 10 million. <clears throat> so um, we're, we're very much, uh, and it's from almost 2,000 donors so far. So, you know, again, some people are donating $5 or $10 or $50 or $100, and some are donating, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, or three quarters of a minute. And the, the thing is that these can be matching grants, um, multi-year grants till the end of 2022, because that's going to take us that long to finish our studies and negotiate with FDA. So we can take matching grants like this year, next year, or the year after up till the end of 2022. So I guess that would be an appeal if anybody knows uh, potential donors, uh, just let me know and, and we'll reach out to them because it is a long way from 3.6 million to 10 million and we've only got um, two months to go, but, but we're hopeful. And so I think that's just um, an overview of where are we at. I, I think the field is um, seeing so much growth, uh, just I guess, <clears throat> since you've had presentations before about the NYU psilocybin team. So Steve Ross contacted me. He had some donors who are uh, investors who want to give 40 or $50 million to go back to study um, psilocybin for cancer patients because the other studies are now psilocybin for depression. Uh, Compass is major, uh, is uh, treatment resistant depression, USONA major depression disorder. So I've opened up all of our experts to, to Steve Ross. And so there are, um, you know, investors very much eager to help out in any different way. But, but we think that we need that nonprofit, um, sort of hybrid nonprofit owns the benefit corp. We will sell MDMA for a profit and we will use the profits for further research. So we're not continually asking donors for money. Um, but if things are moving forward really, really well. And I do think that um, the kind of work that I'm hoping that we will be able to do with with Rachel and her team, and then also with this uh, Sandra Barnes and the Provence. And um, that I think this field, um, if we're careful, we'll just continue to get more legitimized and more appreciated. And so um, 
overall. I, oh, and, and I'll just say the last thing, sorry, <laughs> and you know this, this is my last thing for real, is that I gave a talk at UMass Worcester and um, organized by their uh, psychiatric residents. It was the first in a series. And when they invited me, I was super excited because what I knew is that president-elect of the American Psychiatric Association is on the faculty of UMass Worcester Medical School. Uh, uh, Jeffrey so I said, we have Jeffrey Geller be on a um, discussion after I do my presentation. And he agreed to do that. And then I said, let's get Paul Summergrad, who's head of psychiatry at Tufts, who also used to be the president or who used to be the president of the American Psychiatric Association. And he agreed to be on the discussion as well. So it was me and the next president of the American Psychiatric Association and the former president all together talking about how important the whole field of psychedelic research was. So it was just really encouraging. And there's all sorts of things like that happening. That's great. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. As always, Rick, you're incredibly inspiring. <laughs> so thank you. I do have one question here in the chat at this point. Mm -hmm. um, can you reassure us all a bit more about the core patent of Ibogaine for opiate addiction in the, being in the public domain? Yeah, so um, this is an interesting story. So in 1986, when I started MAPS as nonprofit, um, Howard Lotsoff, who was part of the original group that learned about um, Ibogaine uh, for opiate addiction, um, they got use patents on Ibogaine for opiate addiction, and they started a company in a for-profit way. Um, it was called NDA International. And then Howard enlisted with uh, Deborah Mash and got in touch with her, and, and who is a researcher in Miami, and she agreed to do the first study on Ibogaine, and she actually did get some permission from um, FDA to do a, a bit of a safety study. Um, and so when Deborah Mash started doing it, then Howard ran out of money um, and she continued to do it. And then she discovered Noribogaine, a long lasting metabolite of Ibogaine, which she then patented. And then Howard sued her. He said, how can you do that? You know, I funded part of the study. And then multiple people in the whole Ibogaine field started suing each other. And it was just horrible. And that's where I contacted their patent attorney. That's where I developed the anti-patent strategy for use patents. But the core patent of large doses of Ibogaine for opiate addiction, when I saw all these people suing each other, I felt like there was just, um, it, it was just self-destructive, but the, the whole field really uh, was set back um, until those patents expired and now they have expired. So what, what Deborah Mash has done is she's got all sorts of patents on nor Ibogaine Mm -hmm. on Ibogaine for nicotine addiction. She spent a lot of money on getting um, various patents for various different things, but they don't um, block the core patent, which is in the public domain. And so Atai acknowledged that when I talked to them. So I think that, um, uh, you know, nor Ibogaine um, as a long lasting metabolite, if you want to use that as a, um, separate drug to reduce craving, then that's patented. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and I'm sure that Deborah has tried to patent other things about Ibogaine as well, but, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's not gonna be successful. And so the core patent is in the public domain. Thank you. Oh, I see Marsha has a, a question here. I'll say, is there a link for discussion um, with the APA leaders? Um, we would have to see, I think it may be, but it, it would be the UMass Worcester um, group. Um, and I can tell you there, let's just see. Um, here we go. Uh, ben Wexler is the um, person. I'll put his um, email in the, um, in the chat. And, we, and I'm sure it's available because they just had um, Jordan uh, Slushauer talk about um, psilocybin mm -hmm. and and that's been made available as well so if you write to uh, Bennett there um, he should provide the link which I just put in the in the chat for um, that presentation great thank you yeah any other questions while we're lucky enough to have Rick with us 
All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rick, very much for coming on. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everyone who presented earlier. And thank you to everyone who's still hanging in there. <laughs> it's been a great meeting. We'll look forward to seeing you September 13th. And we have Annie and Michael Mithoffer with us. And then we'll let you know the date in October that we want to do the diversity, outreach, and inclusion. And in November, we have Tony Bassas, and we're looking maybe for someone else. We'll keep you posted. So stay well, everyone. Looking forward to when we can be together in person, but this has been pretty wonderful being with you like this. So thank you. And thank you, Sherry, for all you do to make this happen. No problem. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank yep. you. Thanks, everybody.